Okay, going to pick up with an extension of the analysis on the February topic. This time going to look at the actual decision in a little more detail. Because the topic asks about whether or not the case was rightly decided, very often a pro case has the option of just simply mirroring the majority opinion in the case. I talked about it a little bit in the general analysis. I want to use this time to talk a little bit more about the actual opinions themselves, the arguments in them, which of them teams are and are not obligated to defend, and how to adapt them into the round, because again, the resolution is slightly different than the case behind it. So in Shelby v. Holder, there were three opinions. There was a majority opinion, there was a concurrence, and there was a dissent. If you were to print them all so the smallest one is one page, then the concurrence would be a single page, the majority opinion would be eight pages, and the dissent would be twelve pages. The reason for these different lengths is the concurrence doesn't really have to say anything except why it differs from the majority opinion, and it's also written by just one judge, Justice Clarence Thomas, who's known for having very little to say in general, both in questions and in opinions, so it's the shortest at one page. At eight times its length, we have the majority opinion, which spends most of its time early on talking about what it doesn't disagree with and how this isn't actually ruling contrary to precedent in Northwest Austin and the other cases before that, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The dissent is the longest and does two things. The first thing that it does is talk about why the burden set in Northwest Austin is still fulfilled. The second is give lots and lots of examples of present abuses going on. Generally speaking, those aren't denied in the majority opinion, it just talks about why there are other bigger issues than those. So I'm going to start with the majority opinion, move from there into the concurrence, and probably do the dissent as a separate analysis, just because it's a pretty big chunk of its own, and doesn't relate as directly to arguments that will be made in rounds on this resolution. So let's start with first page of the majority opinion. If you look at section 1A, it talks a little bit about the 15th Amendment and talks a lot about a case called Katzenbach. Katzenbach is referring to Katzenbach versus Morgan, which was a case in 1966, which talks about how the last section of the 14th Amendment gives Congress power to affirmatively protect voting rights. Basically, that if they think it is necessary, they can take action before they are taken away to four states to comply with the 15th Amendment because of power given to them with the 14th Amendment. The second thing that it does is go into a little bit of history of voting rights between 1965 and the present, talking about in particular Johnson versus DeGrande, which was a case dealing with Dade County in Florida, in which two of the justices who were in the majority opinion here, Scalia and Thomas, dissented. And Johnson versus DeGrande talked about what can be done to block these voting laws preemptively from going into effect. They bring this up partly because they want to make it clear that they're only talking about Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act and not Section 2, which they say is permanent, applies nationwide, and is not an issue in this case. Generally speaking, a lot of the early parts of the majority opinion are like playing defense in a debate case. What they are doing is they are saying, here are things we are not changing, here are other checks that are still in place, here are things you don't need to worry about, here are other ways we have of solving, here are reasons that getting rid of Section 4 won't really be a problem. So again, up until the last quarter or so of it, that's what the majority of this is doing. It's a retrospective history of voting rights. And what this does is two things. First off, it gives important context for the round as a whole. Second off, it can be drawn from to prioritize certain impacts and to weigh certain arguments in a way that might actually help the con team. A lot of con teams are looking for cards that say, well, any increase in voter discrimination is too much, or stopping voter suppression is the number one priority, or upholding the 15th Amendment is the number one priority. If the pro team 
is endorsing the majority opinion, if the pro team is siding with those four or five justices, then they are, in effect, agreeing to all of those because those are bright lines that they draw here. They say, for instance, any discrimination in voting is too much, but, and then go on from there. So those are certainly places that both teams can draw arguments from. Aside from that, the other thing that's worth noting is that some of these sections were set up for purpose or effect. Some of the sections of the country that were affected under Section 4. And again, they talk a lot about how that was the original, but it was broadened since then. How there's more to it than just having a purpose or an effect, that when Congress renewed it in the 21st century, what they actually did was also say, or anything that could aid a minority, proportionately or disproportionately, but that is being rejected for discriminatory reasons. So that broadening is another thing they allude to on the first page, and that becomes an issue later on. A lot of times you'll see in this majority decision and in the dissent, CFR mentioned. Like, for instance, it says, again, at the end of section 1A, C28 CFR Part 51, Act 2012. And everything that mentions the CFR is actually just talking about guidelines for Voting Rights Act enforcement. How the Department of Justice is obligated to enforce the Voting Rights Act. There's not too much else in the history lesson until we get down to where it talks about in 1982, where it says that that was the first time the Act was reauthorized, but the coverage formula was not altered. And, obviously, that reauthorization did have a constitutional challenge against it. The challenge before that was George v. United States in 1973, and in it, the important thing is the court said the burden, the burden is on the state to prove that there was no intended discrimination. It doesn't matter whether there was or wasn't discrimination, as long as it wasn't intended before then. With that, it clearly states that even if the state didn't mean to discriminate, they have to prove that they didn't. It can't just be, oh, well, this was accidental, the burden's on them to show that they had the purest of intentions going in. And then the next one was Rome versus United States, which was also in Georgia, and once again reified the notion of pre-clearance saying that the Attorney General of the state can't really do anything about that. Pre-clearance is something that has to come from the Department of Justice. So, from there you get to Lopez versus Monterey County, which is the first one since the 1982 reauthorization, which was a challenge in California where there were two different ways of revising voting districts in Monterey County both of which could have been deleterious to minorities. And in that case, they opted to go with the prior of the two and said that any laws, even if the intentions were good, are unenforceable unless pre-cleared. And California is not a typical Section 4 state, but Monterey County was included because of the various bars it placed on minority voting, in the 1950s, 1960s, so on and so forth. The most recent authorization was in 2006. Again, they didn't update the formula, and it persists until 2031, 25 years after the reauthorization, and a big part of the argument in the majority opinion is that you can't base who needs preclearance in 2031 on who did what in 1966. And again, that's when they amended Section 5 to prohibit more conduct than before. The question that you should be asking yourself here, as either team, is, is this a reason to curtail Section 4? Is the fact that Section 5 was broadened what makes Section 4 unconstitutional or not? And that's the advantage of going towards the concurrence rather than the middle ground of the majority opinion if you are pro, or saying that the decision, even if there could have been other similar right decisions, was not rightly decided on con, 
because most of the objections you've heard so far in the majority opinion are based on Section 5 rather than Section 4. Northwest Austin, like I talked about in the prior analysis, was the most recent case. In it, they said that normally the court will not decide a constitutional question if there is some other ground upon which to dispose of the case. We would much rather not rule on whether an act of Congress is constitutional or not. They did, however, explain that Section 5 has substantial federalism costs and that states should enjoy equal sovereignty. Basically, that no one state should have more power than another or more independence from the federal government than another. It doesn't mean that one state shouldn't have more electoral votes or shouldn't have a bigger economy or shouldn't have more people, but it does mean that any way the federal government regulates one state, it should be able to regulate all of them and that no state should have to ask permission for things that other states are allowed to do automatically because then some states write their own laws and some states are more like colonies of Washington that have their laws written for them, again, according to the theory of federalism that's being advanced here. The other thing that's worth noting is they explain in Northwest Austin that things have changed in the South, voter turnout and registration rates now approach parity. It's important on con to note that passive voice is being used here. The dissent does not use passive voice for this. It gives the sentence a subject, it gives the sentence an actor, it says the Voting Rights Act has done these things, rather than these things have happened while the Voting Rights Act existed. Causality is an important question for the two sides to contend with here. The other thing that's worth mentioning here is that Northwest Austin questioned whether the problems that Section 5 meant to address were still concentrated in a jurisdiction singled out for preclearance. Dissent thinks that doesn't matter, Majority thinks it does. For them, it's a question of the magnitude. Is it as bad? For the other side, it's a question of, has it changed? Not, are other states doing it too? Are there problems in other parts of the country? Con side, the dissent, doesn't care about that. Pro side is saying, whether or not the, the, those places are having problems, it has changed for the better here. So even if it is still a problem, it is not as big of a problem. It also says at the end here, eight members of the court subscribed to these views. And that's a bit of a stretch because of how Supreme Court politics work. Eight members of the court ruled that way, maybe for slightly different reasons. Some of the justices who were on the fence went on to the majority particularly because the majority was worded that way. That doesn't necessarily mean that every single justice subscribed to every single view of the majority opinion. So that's something that both sides are going to use to try and paint the other side into a corner later on. The other thing that's worth mentioning is in Section B, it talks about how the evidence before Congress in 2006 was sufficient to justify reauthorizing, which later on in the same decision, they say, well, maybe it kind of was, maybe it kind of wasn't. We don't really know. Congress just seemed to think it was, and we're not going to take a stance on that. Also in Section B, it talks about how the evidence for singling these, act, these jurisdictions out is less robust and a close question. And again, this wasn't a unanimous decision for the circuit court either. Um, a justice by the name of Williams dissented, saying there's no positive correlation between being included in Section 4 and having low registration or turnout, specifically of black voters. He said that any correlation was actually reverse causal, it went the other way, and that these states actually have higher turnout. Again, this depends on how you spin the numbers, whether you look at percentage of population versus percentage of registered voters, registered voters versus voters turning out, does this show that certain states have different demographics, or does it show that there's active suppression measures that have expired, and active participation measures that are in place and improving it? He also did his own analysis, disaggregating the reported cases state by state, and said the five worst uncovered jurisdictions 
So that art in Section 4, other parts of the country, have worse records than eight of the covered jurisdictions, eight of the counties and or states covered. He also says that two of the jurisdictions, Arizona and Alaska, haven't gotten into any trouble with Section 2 since they were placed under Section 4. And again, that divided decision sent it on up to the Supreme Court. The main language of Northwest Austin that Roberts keeps harping on here is that current burdens must be justified by current needs, and that a departure from equal sovereignty requires showing that disparate geographic coverage is related to the problem that it's tar it targets. So that's the theme of Section 2 of the majority opinion. The other thing that it talks about is federalism having value beyond its own sake. So, for instance, when it talks about Bond versus the United States again, which we mentioned previously, it says the federal balance is not just an end in itself, rather federalism secures citizens the liberties that derive from the diffusion of sovereign power. So basically, federalism is important because it allows states to make their citizens freer from the federal government. It allows them to have sovereign power that relates to them rather than to other states in the country with different needs and different populations, and that a decentralized approach allows for more overall freedom for each of the states. And that's the theory of federalism that you'll see throughout this. Section 2 also talks a little about framers' intent of the Constitution, saying the framers intended the states to keep for themselves the power to regulate elections. And even though it admits that the federal government has some control over federal elections, which are still handled locally, that states have broad powers to determine the conditions under which the right of suffrage may be exercised. It goes on to reference Coyle versus Smith, which was a 1911 case that talked about the equality of states newly admitted into the Union compared to states that are already in the Union. Basically saying that it's already a settled question that every state has to have equal rights, no one state is above another state. The conflict here isn't really ought states have equal rights. The arguments being presented in the dissent are not that states shouldn't have equal rights, it's that some states have forfeited certain rights by attempting to diminish the rights of the people in the state. And that's a fundamental conflict you'll see between the majority and the dissent. What matters more, the rights of the state as an entity versus the individual rights of the people within that state? And if you want to protect the rights of the people within the state, do you protect them best by giving the state more rights, or do you protect them best by constraining the state's rights and allowing people to exercise individual rights without potential interference from the state. Basically, is the state going to be part of the solution of increasing the rights of the people in it, or is it going to be part of the problem of decreasing individual rights within the state if the state's rights themselves are not regulated? It then goes on to say, despite the tradition of equal sovereignty, the act applies to only nine states, while one state waits months to use and expends funds to implement a validly enacted law, its neighbor can typically put the same law into effect immediately. So one state has to spend a lot of legal fees, take a lot of time, get a lot of permission to do something that the state right next to it can just say, okay, we want to do this, let's vote on it, it's done. Through the normal legislative process. Preclearance also switches the burden of proof to the jurisdiction rather than to the federal government. No longer does somebody have to, either an individual or the Department of Justice, sue and say, we think that this law is discriminatory. It's up to the state to prove the law isn't going to be discriminatory in either intention or in side effects. Section 2B goes back and talks about what they aren't challenging in 1966. It says that case-by-case -case litigation had proved inadequate. States merely switched to discriminatory devices not covered by the federal decrees, enacted new tests, or defied and evaded court orders. 
enacting new tests doesn't matter because that's also been illegal for decades, but the other parts of it are the difference between first and second generation that's talked about a lot more in the dissent and referenced briefly a little bit later on in the majority opinion. And what that's doing is that is saying that, yes, obviously it's not being done through poll taxes, it's not being done through literacy tests, it's being done through redistricting or through voter suppression rather than through outright banning people from voting. But much more from diluting the power of individual votes. And the pro team and the majority opinion are saying, well, that doesn't matter. That's something that a different law should address. This law wasn't meant to address that. The con team is saying, well, actually, it was meant to address anything that reduces representation in voting, and this falls under that. And the entire point of the Voting Rights Act in the first place was to be able to deal with states that kept switching each time something was found unconstitutional, so preclearance became necessary. A discriminatory voting law only needs to be in place for one election, and that would allow people to vote other, more discriminatory voting laws into effect, because people who are opposed by it, who lose their votes by it, aren't able to come out and vote against it. So, this part at the beginning of Section B is actually something that the con team can use against the pro if the pro endorses the majority opinion, and it's something that the majority opinion has to kind of double back on later on in Section 4. It also talks about how back then there are much lower percentages of people able to vote in these states, and it concluded that under the compulsion of these unique circumstances, Congress responded in a permissibly decisive matter. And extraordinary legislation was intended to be temporary, which is why it has to be renewed, and originally was going to only be renewed after five years. At the time, the coverage formula linked the exercise of authority with the problem that warranted it. That's not something that either side is disputing in the court case itself. It is something that Pro can dispute in the actual debate, right? If they want to take a hardline federalist approach and go above and beyond what the majority opinion says, but it's not something that either side is obligated to defend on this topic. Part C, again, references the same quote from Northwest Austin and bases a lot off of that. The passive voice quote that talks about how these rates now approach parity, blatantly discriminatory evasions are rare, etc., etc. And then they say that this isn't just their conclusion from Northwest Austin, this is also Congress's conclusion. Congress said the same thing in 2006, that significant progress has been made in eliminating first-generation barriers, including increased registered voters, turnout, and representation. Obviously, Congress didn't feel to solve the problem because they said that while renewing the act, but they're pointing out that even Congress agreed that it has, to some extent, served its purpose and transformed the landscape of the jurisdictions that are covered under it. It goes on to say that, more specifically, there has been approximately a 1,000% increase since 1965 in the number of African-American elected officials in the six states originally covered by the Voting Rights Act. So that would be an increase from about 2% to about 20%. Khan takes this as an indicator of its success and says that a larger increase should be forthcoming until it matches that percentage of the population. So a minority that makes up 30% of the population should be able to have 30% of the candidates. Pro is probably going to side with the majority here and say that it has served its purpose, there are fair chances in elections for everyone, and that is never totally proportionate representation anyway. Third party candidates, for instance, can receive 3% of a vote and get 0% of the seats. So there's always going to be some statistical bias towards the larger number, especially in a democracy where sometimes 51% is functionally 100% because the majority tends to have ways of getting its way, especially when things are split into districts. Whether we're talking the Electoral College determining the president, whether we are talking about the majority deciding on a law in Congress, so on and so forth. 
They then go on to say, Due to the Voting Rights Act, our nation has made great strides, yet the Act has not eased the restrictions in Section 5 or narrowed the coverage formula in Section 4B. And that these features were reauthorized as if nothing had changed. Congress also expanded Section 5. They previously interpreted it to only have the purpose or effect standard we talked about, but in 2006, it also prohibited laws that, and the quote is, could have favored such groups but did not do so because of a discriminatory purpose. So laws that people said, well, we want to change the voting districts, or we want to change the polling process in this way, but we realize this would help the wrong people, so now we're not going to do it. And that backtracking on those also triggers the Voting Rights Act. This takes us to the third part of the majority opinion, which is actually where Khan starts to differ from Pro. The majority of this so far is agreeing there have been improvements on the ground, agreeing this comes from the deterrent effect of Section 5. However, Pro says that under that theory, Section 5 would be effectively immune from scrutiny. And that that's a problem because saying well, of course, we can keep it indefinitely. It's always going to deter people from doing this. Even if it's not timely anymore, even if it's not actually being used for anything anymore, just having it there as a deterrent would be a reason the court could never rule on it because nothing it does could possibly be unconstitutional. And that's where they start to differ. Again, this falls back on the language of Northwest Austin. Current burdens, current needs, sufficiently related to the problem. They say, on the other hand, coverage today is based on decades-old data and eradicated practices. Racial disparities were compelling evidence, but there is no longer such a disparity. And again, that's something that is definitely disputed by both sides. In 1965, states could be divided into two groups. Those with the recent history of voting casts and tax and low voter registration and poll taxes and low turnout, and those without. 3B says, the government's defense of this formula is limited. The government contends the formula is reverse engineered, and that they came up with which states needed to be under it, and then found criteria to describe them. But the criteria changed, the intent was still to have those states under it, and that shouldn't be changed. Then say the analysis in Katzenbach, which upheld this from the Supreme Court in 1966, was quite different. So even if Congress intended it to be these states, regardless of the reasons, and just knew these were the states, that congressional intention doesn't matter because the court reasoning set, says what the law is there for, not the lawmakers. So basically, legislative intent doesn't matter anymore at the point that Katzenbach says that the targeting should have been done for these reasons. The lawmakers' intentions are not clarified in the law itself and therefore shouldn't be precedent that gets ruled on. It then talks about how whether or not a low voting rate is pertinent, and it says that the voting rate is what matters for determining widespread disenfranchisement. And again, that's a question of quantity versus quality, turnout versus value. Is it the number of voters that come out that matters, or is it the voice those individual voters have, how much their votes count for? For instance, in 2012, in the congressional elections, every single seat in the House was up for re-election. One party got 51% of the vote, and 46% of the seats. So 201 seats, 234 seats, despite having 33 fewer seats and 1.36 million more voters. So the argument would be that even though a lot of people were able to vote who would have been previously able to vote, their votes didn't mean anything because even though they were the majority, it didn't matter in terms of what actually happened for who got elected to represent who. The majority of the country voted for one party, the majority of seats went to the other party. It then goes on in 3b to say that the government fails to back the argument that because the formula was relevant in 1965, its continued use is permissible as long as any discrimination remains, regardless of how the discrimination compares to discrimination in states unburdened by the coverage. So on con, this is an argument to increase the use of Section 3 to bail in more states. Or on pro, this is an argument to decrease Section 4. And the basic idea is, these other states are doing it too. Khan says, okay, so bail them in.